Okay, uh, we are live. Uh, welcome everyone to the second uh, 4844 breakout. Um, I guess the goal for this call is just to kind of get everyone on the same page about the progress on the implementation, on the KCG ceremony, um, and then take some time to chat about like what we see as the biggest uh, blockers or like issues that we need to address uh, on EEIP. Um, and uh, also kind of try and list out like what are the types of skills that would be helpful to have people contribute uh, to the EIP. Um, so like yesterday, there were a bunch of people talking on Twitter about like how important this is. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, a few people already reached out, but if there's a way we can just better articulate like what's needed and what's helpful, um, I think it'll help filter the different people who, who'd like to help out. Um, yeah, that should, that should be it. Um, I guess to kick it off, uh, Mofi, and I don't know if Michael is on the call. Um, I don't see him. Um, but yeah, Mofi, do you want to start and give us an update on like the implementation and where things are at there? Do you have- I can't hear you. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're muted. Yeah, no worries. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, it's a bit uh, it's a bit quiet, but we can't hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll try to speak louder. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been working on the implementation. Um, so where are we at? Um, we. Uh, Basically, I've been working through the spec uh, and implementing. We have like implementations of the EIP for the Postgres spec for Prism and Geth. And um, we have most of the spec now, no doubt, but there are a couple of issues that I guess we'll discuss later during the meeting. Um, right now, uh, we have um, an implementation for the um, law of verification optimization. And this is something that you have worked on um, a couple weeks ago, where we are adding these two groups um, to speed up oh. the uh, verification of laws. And uh, is it the wrong mic? Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's a bit. It, it, yeah. All right, let me try the same way. Oh, that. This, this is actually perfect. Whatever you just did worked. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is it better now? Yeah, better. much better. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, so yeah, um, we're currently, we have like most of the spec now now, and other than the couple open issues that we need to resolve, um, right now we're working on just optimizing the implementation, making it um, as fast as possible. And the point of contention there is the um, KCG blob verification. Um, there's like an open issue where um, we wanna ensure that um, verifying blobs is in a DOS vector. So there's been some work that's been put into the spec and the implementation to uh, speed that up. And uh, yeah, that's mostly where we are right now. Um, and also like a quick um, like prelude to announcement, um, we are working on a DevNet um, that will be publicly available pretty soon. So looking forward to having like external contributors uh, joining the network. Um, and testing things out because uh, that's going to be really needed. Nice. Um, anyone have questions, comments, thoughts on that? Um, I guess, do you have a link to like the repo that's uh, you and, or repos that you and Michael are working off to share here with, with folks? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, post that in the Zoom. Um, awesome. Uh, by the way, Mofi, you asked some questions about the verification code and why it's so slow and all that stuff. Um, I tried to answer it last week. I hope my answers made sense, but if they didn't, just like ask again and or we can do a call, uh, the two of us to figure out in more details how to optimize the code. 
Yeah, thanks, George. I did skim through them, but I haven't looked into it in detail, but should have more time um, next week to take a closer look at that. Sweet. Um, were those, those responses like a, a public doc or anyone can look at? Uh, I think it was in the sharded, uh, I think it was in the sharded data chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe it's worth, worth it briefly saying because I also put it in chat. Just, no, but um, like because, because we have this kind of 1559 light mechanism for blobs as well, we kind of, we have a reasonably good understanding of the kind of frequency with which transactions will will come in because the mempool can be very small for them as well. So so you'd only expect like to see one legitimate blob transaction, legitimate meaning that it kind of the commitment actually matches the, the blob sent with it um, coming in every few seconds. So the, the verification of the legitimate ones is not a problem at all, like performance wise. It's really about handling if people spam you with transactions where the blobs just don't match the commitments because then you can't even charge them for, for it. So it's it's like it's similar to like an invalid signature. So it's really mostly about like peer scoring and making sure that you just don't allow one peer to send you multiple of those. And yeah, so so, so, so that's at, at the core of, of the DOS issue. Got it. And as I understand it though, there's just no peer scoring uh, on the execution layer, right? Like there's no, um, yeah, there's no easy way. Like you need to be able to verify them quickly because um, we there's no like uh, granularity in the scoring. Either you stay with the peer or you disconnect them. So um, so you could disconnect the peer, but basically after they've tossed you an ideal, you, you haven't gone down because of that. Yeah. Right. Ideally, um, you, yeah, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, so um, just related to that, um, um, we do have like the peer scoring um, in the consensus layer, but um, there's like a weird issue where um, you sort of have to defer verification of um, block KCGs in consensus um, whenever the block headers are not available. Right, um, and in that point, at, at that in that case, if you are, are ver deferring blob verification, it's much harder to penalize peers if they do send invalid blobs, because it's it's sort of like you'd have to like keep track of like what peer is associated with this blob, and I imagine that's like that complicates the implementation of uh, various uh, consensus points. At least that's what my experience has been implementing this in prison so you uh, mean if the execution layer is not synced like you're in an optimistic sync mode or something like yeah which header did you mean um i'm i'm referring to the the blob sidecar in consensus client so as that's being gossiped um it is possible that you receive a sidecar that's associated with um, a beacon block that um, hasn't been observed yet. And in that case, you want to like defer processing of that blob sidecar rather than just simply rejecting it um, because you it, it might be incorrectly labeled as valid. So if you do defer that processing, then you need to keep track of what peers sent that sidecar. Um, in order to penalize it. And that's just one um, complexity with the implementation. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. So obviously it's like, yeah, we want to make sure that verifying blobs is ideally just like not a DOS vector because it's very impractical on the EL and like somewhat impractical on the CL to, to deal with peers based on that. Well, we do do this on the CL, like this, you know, if you get an attestation ahead of time, it's the same problem. So okay. it's not impossible. It just probably is more complicated than like an MVP. Got it. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Um, okay. 
Uh, and Ansgar, yeah, I see you have a comment about like the, the CL sync and, and the side cars. Um, does it make sense to like discuss this now? Yeah, I guess I guess so actually. Yeah, if we're in the implementation stuff. Um, yeah, do you want to take a minute, Ansgar, and kind of share your thoughts on that? Right, so I think this is basically just a question that a couple people had when we were discussing this. So. Uh, in, in, in Paris. So basically, uh, I think for now, the plan is to, um, uh, as Mofi was, was, was saying just, uh, just now as well, to have this, this sidecar architecture where basically um, blobs are more or less gossiped independently uh, from, from, from the beacon blocks uh, between CL clients. Um, and that can lead to all these differences where sometimes you get a blob and you haven't actually received the, the, the observed the, the beacon block yet and the other way around and, 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 and everything. And um, there was some concern. I think I only heard that like secondhand. Like I think Proto was saying that some CL client teams had kind of. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe Pro, Pro, Pro could say something. But like, there, there were people that that basically, yeah, raised some concern that this, this might introduce sync complexity. Um, I'm not sure Proto if you wanted to say say like some some to that. Oh. Um, because uh, and, and 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 so basically the the conversation that we were having is whether or not it's actually worth introducing this extra complexity now. Of course, the 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 reason people did it in the first place or came up with this architecture in the first place is that it's more cleanly forward compatible with full sharding because um, basically then we could just drop that that whole kind of uh, um, it was because back there, like like in the future we'll have to have um, blobs and blocks be separated anyway because you know clients will no longer download all the blobs um so it's cleaner to already have that separation today but it does front load some of the extra complexity so if we want to really follow the strict minimum complexity approach for 4844 um there is a case to be made to just to return to something where basically um you you, you bundle the the blobs and the blocks after all um, so that like whenever you receive a blob, it comes with a block and the other way around. So there's never like there's there's no extra complexity around having one but not the other and, and, and things like that. I think that's fair. Um, long term, if thanks sharding, we may need the separation. Short term, maybe I think it's up to implementers to make the right call. Mofi, what do you think? Yeah, I think that um, bundling them will simplify this implementation, um, at least for present. One concern um, I do kind of like have is, uh, so the advantage of like kind of keeping them separate is it makes it easy and quickly to um, drop invalid sidecars before we even observe them. And what I mean by this is basically, if you observe like the beacon block that is invalid and you immediately later receive like the associated sidecar, um, you don't have to like do expensive valid for that. You can just drop it immediately. And um, if we start bundling things, there is a network cost of like transmitting the whole gamut. And therefore, um, it's, I guess, like you're shifting the, uh, the cost. Um, th there's like a cost involved with like always transmitting the uh, entire beacon block and making sure that um, if it's invalid, then you've already incurred that cost of like, you know, storing that beacon block momentarily, which includes the sidecar. And yeah, I guess this issue can be solved with appropriate peer scoring. And maybe, yeah, maybe this is not a non-issue, but that's basically my only concern here with doing this. And Mofi, the current implementation does already separate the sidecars from the regular blocks, correct? Yeah. Okay, so maybe we should not change it for the stability of this definite then, and then take more time to consider whether or not we should merge the two things.
I don't see a short term gain into merging them at yeah. least. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. And I feel like once we have maybe a dev networking and like a kind of these other spec issues resolved, we can also bring this up on the CL calls and like get, and, and in the meantime, also get CL devs to like look into it, assuming they have time, which is a, a very generous assumption. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that like if, if the current version works right now, it's not worth refactoring the entire sync, but it's worth noting that like there might be a simpler approach and yeah, discussing this with CL teams. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, that sounds good. <coughs> cool. Um, any other thoughts, comments on the implementations generally or on sync? A uh, fun thing to add right now, we have the Prism prototype. There's this fork by Mofi in one separate repo. And then there's this other GAF prototype with a fork from uh, Michael de Hoog. Um, so we have these two forks of consensus and execution clients that are that may have this distance in terms of git differences from the latest merge work and so if people from these clients are listening i'd like to hear our feedback about incorporating more of the latest merge work and whether or not it's the right time to start rebasing Okay, yeah. Um, I don't think there's anyone from Geth here. And uh, Terence from Prism told me he could join probably uh, for the second half of the call. So um, yeah, when he joins, we can maybe ask him about that uh, directly as well. Anything else on implementations? Um, okay. I guess oh, yeah. there's, Go ahead. I don't know if we'll get to this later, but there's the uh, issue of um, the KCG libraries we have, um, we are using for the implementation. And you're using what, sorry? The, the KCG libraries. Um, yeah. Uh, we are using for the implementation. <laughs> up, up, up until like the blog verification, um, we've basically just been using one library in GAF and uh, now that we are, uh, we also need some of that functionality in prison, the consensus, uh, we sort of like have to like decide uh, what's like the best approach to. We're using the same um, functionalities across both um, implementations. So on that front, um, we are in contact with the last national people. Uh, I would say that there is progress, but this progress is kind of slow. So like uh, we sent them like that, 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 like over a month ago, we sent them the requirements for what is needed. Mm, they got back to us this week and they told us they're gonna send us back some sort of report on what they gathered from what we sent them and that we should do a call next week to figure out next steps. So, you know, things are moving um and things will probably happen next week um i will report back with what i learned but also another thing i want to raise on this topic is that um, it might be a good idea to have some of the more uh, people more involved in the implementations of this of these things uh involved in such future calls with the supranational people to give a better idea of what is needed in terms of interface, because, you know, like, I think I know what is needed, but maybe someone who is more involved with the actual uh, stuff can give more insight. So uh, I'm going to let you know next week of what happens, but I might ask for some uh, like volunteers to join in future such calls with them to build a better API, basically. 
Cool. Yeah, that's really useful. I know uh, Marius from Geth had mentioned like he had some thoughts on that. Um, so um, he's probably a good person to, to reach out to to join those calls. Right. Um, and beyond obviously like, you know, Mofi and, and, and Michael here as well. But yeah, he on the last one of these calls, he seemed to have some pretty strong opinions about it. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and I guess generally, do people feel like blast is like it basically the best option is to adapt blast and make that better because i believe that's like what all the cl teams use already correct um but there's no kind of other option really on the table right now uh, the the interfaces we need are a very thin wrapper around functionality that Blast already has. I mean, ar around functionality yeah. that any BLS library will implement already. So, um, right. since we're all using Blast, it makes a lot of sense just to um, to to put those in. Got it. Okay. Um, okay, anything else on uh, the implementation? That's all I got. Cool. Any other questions from folks here? Okay. Um, I guess next up, uh, Trent, I see you're here. Do you want to give a quick update on the BLS side of things? Or sorry, not BLS, uh, the case and G side of things. Yeah, I was going to say I could barely cover the KCG side. I definitely can't cover <laughs> BLS, but yeah. Um, so similar to the, since we started this, we're just doing kind of the same stuff. Uh, we have an audit coming up for the um, the ceremony implement, or the, not the implementation, but the, the design of the ceremony um, with SecBit coming up soon. So we're preparing for that in a few weeks. I just shared a link to a bunch of resources, which has um, linked to the implement or one of the implementations, but specifically the calls. If anybody wants to catch up or is curious how far along we are, um, that's the main thing uh, that we're preparing for the audit. Um, and we have the next call next week on Thursday, uh, 11 30 UTC. Awesome. Yeah, there's also a timeline doc in there um, if anybody's curious about when we plan to start this hopefully around devcon and then we'll have an uh we'll have a period of closed contributions before that to, to test it and then um at devcon hopefully we'll have some live contributions from the audience and then it'll run for a few months uh we also have some people starting to work on a couple of test sites uh jeff lampard's been working on that um, to make sure all this stuff works and uh we've started working on an interface that will that user will actually uh, interact with in the browser. So that should be everything. Any general questions that I can maybe answer? Yep. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. I'm just curious, like, what is the size of the ceremony that you have in mind? Number of participants? Yeah. We're hoping for 10,000, which would, depending on who you ask, it would make it the largest uh, trusted setup ceremony. Nice. Any other questions on the ceremony? Okay. Um, I see. Terence has joined. Um, oh, are you? Can you hear us, Terence? Do you have a mic? Yeah, sorry, I had another meeting, but I am here, so feel free awesome. to. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's two. I think there's two things that we discussed that like we're curious to get your your input on. Um, the first is um, around the, uh, the CL Sync. Uh, earlier, we were having a conversation that like we've decoupled Blob Sync from Block Sync to have it be kind of forward compatible with the full sharding approach. 
Um, but that might introduce like more complexity at the CL side. And we were thinking that like there might be value in potentially just recoupling blobs and blocks at the syncing level um, for like the first version of 4844 and then you know eventually making the this the sync um, more decoupled. Um, and I, I, I'm curious, like yeah, generally, do you have any thoughts on that and like how how much of a simplification it would be to like couple them now and like is it or and, and is it valuable to do it or should we try and front load as much of like the sync design as possible? Right, we definitely had this conversation at, at ECC, which I remember, and I am in favor of the coupling approach. I'm not too worried about like trying to be the same as sharding in day zero. I think like with, with, with a real then sharding, we need to have a far, hard fork anyway, so we can change it then. It's not that big of a change, but it would be nice to just like, I think we can definitely ship for, for, for slightly faster, just couple them together. It's less engineering challenge that way. It's less implementation. It's also better UX. So I am I I am twenty percent in favor of the coupling. Okay, awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, second question we had for you is um, the diffs between like the current prototype are starting to diverge from like master with the merge work. Um, yeah. and Prism and Get. When do you yeah. think is like the right time to rebase this? Like, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Proto asked me to help. I am, so I think I should be free after you know, a few days, just trying to finish last minute um, math boost related um, issues. So yeah, I should be free in a few days and then I'm more than happy to help. Just send it over the branch. I can rebase it for you. Shouldn't take me more than a few hours. Yeah. Oh, okay, well. Nice. Um, sweet. I think those were the two things for, for Terrence. Um, sweet. And I guess, um, yeah, the other thing I, I, I want to make sure we, we chat about is like, um, we have folks now, like, uh, obviously on the optimism side, on, on Coinbase, kind of working on this. Um, but this is like a pretty big EIP. And there's obviously a bunch of folks like, sorry, so by this, I mean the implementations, uh, there's a bunch of other work as well, but um, yeah, there's obviously a lot of work to do to like get this implemented and tested in clients. Um, and it seems like there's some interest by like the community to, to help. And um, I guess I'm curious, like from like Coinbase and Optimism, like what like skill sets or like tasks do you think would be most helpful to have people help out with um, that are like maybe a bit like independent from the work that you're doing or that like can be parallelized um, if there's like engineers who have some time and like, yeah, experience that, that can help here. Um, I guess, yeah. One, I'll start. One that's will be really useful once we have the JetNet running is just having users in the network, um, testing all sorts of scenarios, um, sending blobs, downloading blobs, um, ensuring that you know the um, the current gas fee um, calculation sort of works um, in the dev environment, and yeah, we just like to have more participants in the. Yeah, it'd be funny for the four test net. That would be super useful. Um, another thing would be um, if people should just take a look at the the codes, um, the various repos that I posted in Zoom. Um, maybe we can make these available um, somewhere like in the community call agenda. But take a look at the repo, um, see if like we can improve test coverage, um, particularly in Prism because um, a lot of the testing we're doing here is uh, based on another repo that basically um, interrupts both get and prism for testing. Um, but it would be nicer to have like more test coverage in prison to target specific scenarios um, that um, um, ensure that you know the EIP is uh, as robust as possible.
Got it. And I guess in terms of like actually implementing things, um, uh, I guess we have like kind of the Coinbase, Coinbase folks working on, on the Geth implementation, you working on, on the Prism side. Um, I see there's like a bunch of Pine devs on the call. Like, do we think, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, mess, mixed up, but Geth and Prism and Coinbase and, and Optimism. Um, yeah. Do you think it, it, it makes sense to have like other implementations sooner rather than later, or should our focus be like, let's get these two kind of as as far as possible and, and then add some more? Yeah, I think it, it makes sense to get as far as possible because yeah. we are still making changes to the spec, um, particularly the gas price update rule. Um, we're probably going to have a discussion later right now um, on where, how we're going to do that. Also, if we do decide to like go ahead with bundling the block, um, beacon block and sidecars, and that's like another change that other implementers will have to like do. So it, it just makes sense to like consolidate um, all the changes in one. And once we get to a point where um, we're sort of like the, the spec is sort of stable, then we can start introducing more implementations. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, and so, bas so basically, yeah, I guess the two main things now is just like testing on the DevNet um, as soon as that's out, and then um, basically uh, seeing if there's test coverage that can be approved uh, in the in the current uh, Prism and Get implementations. Um, those would be like the two most useful things, right? Yeah, but that said, I think if you know someone came along was an expert in a particular client we're not working on and wanted to get started, we wouldn't. We certainly wouldn't stop them. Yes. Yeah. yeah obviously. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I guess would it be helpful, like if someone comes along and they're an expert in Prism or Geth, you know, is that also helpful to have more people working on those specific implementations, um, or is it just like too much people on the same kind of parts of the code? Uh, no, I think uh, that would also be helpful. Um, there are like two or three major items I foresee in like the next couple of weeks where um, back like two or three people can work on um, differently without like stepping each other's toes. So yeah, I think that will be helpful um, having like uh, experienced Prism or Geth devs uh, contributing to the implementations. Okay. Great. So, um, so I guess if you're an experienced Geth or Prism dev listening, um, you can reach out like to me or I guess Liam. You also posted about this yesterday, so I'll put you on the spot here. Um, yeah, if you're if you're interested in contributing and like if you're not sure where to start, we linked. Uh, I'm, I have notes for this call, so we linked a bunch of stuff there. Um, and then like the very like first place is probably either the DevNet or looking at the specs and and kind of diving deeper from there. Does that make sense? Um, sweet. Oh, oh. Um, okay, so I guess, yeah, the last thing I wanted to cover today, and I think it should bring us right to time, is um, just basically like our list of, uh, uh, of issues from the last time, and we touched on some of these already, but not, not all. Um, so on the KZG library section, you know, we're still working on improving this. Um, on this, as we discussed the sync uh, a fair bit. Um, and I guess the last one is like the fee market. Um, yeah, uh, and, and I guess just to, to, to put some context here. So right now the current DevNet implementations use kind of the, the, um, the naive fee market with like a hard coded, uh, hard -coded gas price uh, per, per blob all the time. Um, this is not gonna work. Um, there was a proposal in the EIP for just a more complex one that was basically uses EIP 1559 uh, style pricing for, for the fee market. On the last call, we kind of discussed moving this from the uh, from a special contract in the state to the block header. Um, yeah, and I guess I was curious to hear A, from people like, you know, does this general fee market just make sense? Do we think it's good enough to move forward? And B, 
does everyone agree that just having this in the in the block header is is the way to go? Yeah. Oh, Ansgar. Yeah, sure. So um, I, th I think kind of with regards to the header, uh, I think basically everyone agreed that it might just be the more practical way to go for now. Uh, the only person disagreeing was Vitalik, incidentally, but uh, um, I, I, I think he's, 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 yeah, he's not on the call, so, you know, uh, for fitting his, his voice here. Um, I think on the mechanism itself, uh, generally kind of the mechanism proposed by the AP more or less, uh works uh the only reason why we kind of why for a while now it's been a somewhat open research topic is just that there are things we would like to get that are not fully provided by the fee mechanism but they are more like nice to have so basically um for one it's uh that while this works really well for something like blobs where demand is relatively slow moving wouldn't quite I, like perfectly be be uh, generalizable because for like basically sorry stepping a step back like uh, this would be the first time that we introduced like a two dimensional pricing mechanism one dimension for bobs one dimension for normal execution um, roller projects for a while now have been saying that they would really like uh, to have like a standard standard for doing two dimensional pricing because uh, they have to do that anyway because they have to price layer two gas and layer one gas in, inside one transaction basically for now all rollups basically hand roll their own uh, mechanism for for like two dimensional pricing um we would like for the for, for it for four mechanism basically to be generalizable the current version is not ideally generalizable just because uh like um in 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 that context kind of the two dimensions would be much more fluctuating and because they share the same gas limit that that might become a problem again not a problem for blobs just a problem for generalizing the mechanism and then also kind of similarly we would also ideally want this to be maximally forward compatible with like full on multi-dimensional pricing further down the road but i think on both of these counts um it's in this it's a somewhat similar situation like we when we were talking earlier about bundling blobs and blocks on the cl side where we might just want to be practical and say we move forward with a minimum working um, version for now. Um, and then, you know, we can always iterate on it later. So uh, I think uh, there's still some effort to try and maybe look into this whole kind of uh, compatibility with layer twos, um, just because they would really like that, I think. Um, so maybe we'll, you know, if, if we uh, come up with a, a slightly alternative design within the next month or so, that would uh, include that, I think, well, like all the better, but for now we can just, you know, we can just work on the basis that we have a mechanism that is good enough, basically. Sorry, that was a bit long, but I hope that that made sense. Yeah, no, thanks. That's, that's quite useful. And yeah, Proto, I was going to be you because you have a bunch of comments on like clients PR. So yeah. Right. I was just about to mention that uh, Light Client does uh, have a PR open in the EIP's repository to update the old mechanism to a new mechanism that uses a header field instead of state, but then otherwise does not change anything about the previously proposed fee update mechanism. And I want to note here that this is not exactly the same as EIP 1559. The adjustment works a little bit different. And I think there are some subtle issues with this update mechanism. And I'm not entirely sure what the right direction is to correct them. With this blob pricing problem, we have this balance we can make or this incentive, whether or not we want to prefer a burst of blob data or a repeated small, uh, smaller burst. So if we go over the target, the gas price or the fee rises. And this is incrementally more and more costly. And so small bursts right now are more expensive than grouping all the, uh, the blobs together, even though the total amount of throughputs after the end of the, the example is the same. And so at this question, do are we more concerned about bandwidth on the network and about the stability of the bandwidth or are we more concerned about the processing 
because with processing, I think it might actually be favorable to create this incentive for a large burst of blobs rather than this more stable amount of blobs. I don't think we care much about either of those. I thought what we care about is long-term storage costs. Like, isn't that the dominant factor here by a pretty large margin? We have pruning. So long-term is really just a month worth of data. There's this other issue with the current design of the fees. Here, I'll give an example. If you exceed the target, then the price will go up. And then if for say a month or whatever the period is that blobs are retained, if you perfectly match the target, then you will eventually prune the excess, but the gas price will still be sticky and will still be high. So even after pruning, after correcting it for a long period of, and stabilizing it for a long period of time, the gas price is still high due to the old excess. And so I think the gas price update should consider pruning perhaps, and we should consider like the, the kind of characteristic that we want with the blob throughput. If you want like repeated small additions or infrequent large additions. So for one that. of the concerns, so, so sorry, just to briefly mention, I think one of the concerns with um, uh, on, on the pruning side was just that it might be um, not, not ideal to basically um, and try and specific retention, like specific assumptions uh, about retention periods in the pricing mechanism itself, because otherwise this is basically just a, a client parameter where of course, I don't know, we, 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 we like to give some defaults and some, some, some recommendations, but basically if you want to run a CL and just drop blobs after a week, you can do that. Or if you want to keep them for a year, you can do that. Um, but at the moment we kind of have, have some sort of like finite memory set in, 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 in the block pricing mechanism. And of course we are, we're starting to try and that other than that, I think it's perfectly reasonable and it's also not, not too complicated, I think to, to do that. So but we should, I think no matter what, sorry, I was just going to say, I agree. We probably shouldn't enshrine some specific value, but we should price the fact that like they are like temporary to some extent. Right. And it's almost like, you don't want to enshrine like a week versus a month, but you also don't want the mechanism to like even implicitly assume they're going to be stored for a year, if that makes sense. Because that kind of nudges clients to like not store them for a year, which is what we want. But it's, I, I agree, you don't want to have like a, a hard coded cutoff of like this many epochs or something. One approach could be to bias the pricing towards more recent throughput so that older throughput is dampened. I think there is some balance here because otherwise we basically end up pricing blobs based on like very, very old throughput details, which so might already be pruned and it's just makes pricing less accurate in my opinion. I think we can do I mean, better than that. That's exactly the same situation, 1559. However, I believe that the counter argument there is that uh, kind of latent like remem memory of historic pricing is completely lost in noise in the real world. Like, so in, a theory, in, in your theoretical scenario, you had perfectly even uh, throughput except for that one little spike and that one little spike causes that to retain kind of remember the spike forever uh, but in the real world you are never going to get that perfect and as soon as you have any kind of variance that little tiny spike gets lost in the noise like right away I believe um, like I'd be very surprised to see to see like that that kind of that memory matter at all in any like even kind of worst case scenario real world real world situation yeah this is this is maybe like a dumb question, but like, can you just walk us through actually how the repricing occurs? Like, and how it differs from 1559? Yeah. Like, so 1559 is like, I'll, you look at the gas in each block and you go up or down by like 12%. Right. I'll try to give my best interpretation. I <laughs> yeah. do think there is just like a small inconsistency in the explanation of the gas pricing in the EIP currently. 
so I might not be 100% correct about those. Um, so the basic interpretation is that we track the amount of blobs that have been confirmed since the start of the EIP. And we track or we can compute the, the targets, the expected amount of blobs that we, that we would want. Now we take the minimum of those. So we know whether or not we are under or below the target and say, if we're over the target, we're going to adjust the prices upwards. If we're under the target, then we, sorry, if we're under the target, I think the current EIP makes blobs very, very cheap. I don't, I'm not exactly sure if the EIP is correct in this case. But let's just take the case where we are over the target. In the case that we're over the target, we use this this exponential thing where the more we are over the target, the more the blobs will cost. I think there's a ma there's a, a a cap where if it goes below target, it'll take the maximum of target versus where we currently are. So it never actually goes below target. Correct. Right. That was my right. reading. I, I, I think I think that's that's just basically. Um... Uh, so, so it doesn't. So, 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 so I think the the pricing basically the difference between the, the pricing of the the, the proposed pricing for four eight four four and fifteen fifty nine is that fifteen fifty nine basically always does relative adjustments. So it it doesn't care about the absolute value of the base. It basically, just says okay, the block was under full, go down. The block was over full, go up. Whereas, um, uh, so so it's always like just you know it only looks at one last block. Whereas um for 4844 does the, the, the exact opposite it has like this infinite time horizon where it just says i want to always have half of the blob space filled and i just keep track of historically like in accumulating over all history what was the percentage and as long as the percentage was under is under 50 percent, then basically blobs are free um and the moment we are over 50 percent, then blobs uh basically cost something and that price keeps like keeps going up uh, the, the the further we are above fifty percent to basically uh, until we at some point you know get pushed back down to to fifty percent or like there could be some equilibrium where we know we, we are at fifty one percent or something. But now just very briefly saying like why does it not really matter that this is that it has this long term memory and I think that's kind of also what Micah was was uh, um, alluding to. Um, because of this mechanism, we will always end up in a scenario where we are close to 50%. We could be below 50% in the very early days when no one uses blobs, but the, besides that, we'll always be like in the 50 to 55% range or some, something like that, right? Um, and so just because blobs might have been more in demand in the past or something, doesn't really matter because it just means that this value will be at 50, between 50 and 55%. So the, the, the worst case is that now the demand is only 50% and it or 51% and it used to be 55%. So there's like a 4% difference or something. But that that really doesn't make a big difference and it washes out over time. So so it it I agree that maybe it's still preferable to 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 make that more explicit, but it, there can't be a scenario in which like the the historic uh, accumulator is at like 90% or something because that's that's the entire like thing that that the the kind of targeting supposed to help against is that right that makes ah. sense with eip 1559 though we as we are adjusting downwards there's more precision in adjusting downwards whereas in eip 4844 as soon as we're under the target even by a little bit things start to become i think a little bit chaotic as the pricing is not accurate anymore yeah, that seems weird because you could imagine like, I don't know, there's no blobs for a week. That doesn't mean that like we can then like process infinite or like a ton of blobs the week after, right? Like, oh, no, like... but, but, but it kind of does. So, so, so basically the, the idea is that uh, because we have this, this maximum, that's only 2x the average anyway. Like we we would be okay with a sustained oh max, like okay uh, yeah that's okay yeah so we're okay so the assumption we're making here is we're okay with a sustained full blobs for long periods of time which is not an assumption fifteen fifty nine makes that is correct yes I think even okay, um, is okay can with I that. give a counter argument against this 
in your example, when there's a week of no data and then a week of double the amount of data, then on average, there's no excess, but the there's yeah. a bias towards recent data. And so assuming there's pruning or no pruning, we, end, we might end up holding a lot more data due to this, this imbalance over time, right? So because right. Say, the pruning time was a week, now we're holding twice as much as right. might otherwise with normal pruning and normal throughput. Right. right. I, th I think yeah. the, the 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 assessment was just that basically this inefficiency is there. Like you could basically just because, I mean, in the long run, we don't expect this to be the, to really be the case much because uh, you you'd never be like for a sustained period of time be below fifty percent because uh, at least in our assumption there would always be some demand for blobs so that it would be used like before we get dipped down below 50%. Um, but in the early days, it could definitely happen. Um, yeah. And so we have this slight inefficiency that we basically have to be able to handle storing 2x the amount, the average amount for say a month or so, because there would have been an empty month and then a double month. And so we basically have to store 2x. Uh, yeah. For that, we gain the simplicity in the algorithm. So this is a right. trade-off. We could, we could try and make the trade the algorithm more complex and more more sensitive. And then we don't have this 2x storage overhead in the worst case. Yeah, that's a choice. I think we are starting to basically uh, converge on the other problem with uh, this choice between uh, prioritizing many small, um, smaller amounts of blobs versus a few larger amount of blobs. If we have clarity about this point, like what kind of throughput maximum, like in a sustained manner is that we want to favor, then maybe we just also solve for the other problem. Michael? Uh, what, what was the reason behind um, choosing this mechanism instead of the 1559 mechanism? Like what, what is the perceived advantage? They seem like they'd result in basically the same thing, but this one requires an extra header field. Um, Wait, how, how does it require an extra I can header give field? some... Because you have to keep track of how many blobs have since since Genesis. I yeah, can give it's... some details about the header fields and how it would look like if we emulate yeah. the EIP-1559. Um, so sure. 1559 uh, uses... Yeah the parent information, the parent uh, block uh, base fee, and then has this lag to update towards the new base fee, validating that the base fee update is correct. And it uses the total amount of gas that was used to do so. So this is the second header field that is already available for regular gas to be able to do this update with two header fields from the parent block to get and compute the new base fee of the next block. block. With um, this EIP, we don't have such information that captures how many blobs were um, included in the previous block without having to make the full block available. Like the header data itself is not enough to get the right information to update a base fee in the same way that EIP-1559 would do. So instead, okay. this mechanism tracks just that information, the amount of blobs that have been included. And then instead of introducing this base feed that there needs to be updated, it, compu it computes it just from the total amount of data that have, has been included by keeping track, not just of the last parent block, but of all of the total included blobs and then comparing it against a theoretical target based on the, the block height difference and the number of blocks that, uh, the number of blobs that should go into each block. So would the short version of that be that um, if 1559 requires the transactions from the parent block, this does not require the equivalent of that, which would be the, the blob. So if we are going to exactly correct? emulate EIP-1559, we would need to add two fields to the header. One to count the number of blobs 
and one to count the or to represent the base fee for the blobs. Isn't number of so, blobs already in there now? Effectively. How Can so? you repeat that? Isn't the number of blobs already effectively in the block header? We keep track of that. Not total number, but number of blobs in the previous block. No, as blobs right now, they are referenced by the blob transactions. And the blob transactions are just part of the transaction list. Uh, so we only really have a hash of the transaction list, which doesn't really tell how many blobs there are. Is, is this formula written down in the um, EIP at the moment? The one based on total number of blobs uh, for all time? Yeah. Yes, that is in the EIP and in the PR yeah, yeah, of. Yeah. Matt, you can find the, the header based version of that as opposed to reading it from the stat. I'll link it is to it the, the chat. The, the gas price update rule in the AIP, is that correct? It's in there, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, just because we're, we're kind of uh, basically hitting on time here, um, I feel like, yeah, the, the two, like, this idea around like, yeah, short burst versus like long-term history is something that we probably should get like client teams feedbacks on, and especially on the CL side, um, along with the, the sync design. Um, that feels like the main probably like thing here. I guess the other part, like Ensgar, you mentioned around like having L2s being able to use this as well as a pricing mechanism. Um, it feels to me like once we kind of have the preference from the CL teams, that's maybe like the second thing to look at. And and basically those are like the two most important things to figure out for the free market. Does that make sense? Right. Although just just to uh, to clarify, this would not be this would not be on on this question of what specific kind of well, I guess I guess it would also be relevant, okay. like whether it would be short term or long term kind of st stabilization mechanism. I guess they would. Yeah favor of course the short-term stabilization me mechanism but for the there it's, it's much more about uh kind of how how does the the, the two-dimensional pricing actually work so so the way the base the the, the, the eip right now works is just basically basically just translates the variable price into like a variable um amount of gas consumption but then the gas is within the transaction is accounted as normal um that has some like disadvantages that aren't really that relevant for 4844, but they would be more relevant for roll-up. So, so basically, if we wanted to make this kind of more roll-up compatible, that might need might mean we would have to slightly change the way the accounting works as well. Not not just this okay. this design choice, but but yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, but I do feel like yeah. Oh, go ahead. So, am I correct in that this is not adjusting the gas price? It's adjusting the gas uh, cost, like the amount of gas that's used for blob. Yeah, we just said NASCAR. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that, but I'm running out of time, so I won't complain too much right now. Yeah. Yeah. But okay, yeah, that makes sense. I I, I guess it's like yeah, in the if you think of it as like the interloping constraints or something, I just want to make sure that like what we present as like the trade-off space for L2s is, or yeah, is kind of what CL teams want to optimize for. Because like, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's kind of crucial that like CL teams are happy with this uh, if we wanted to implement it on L1. Um, and then, yeah, I guess beyond that, uh, I guess, getting yeah the blst editions uh that'd be really helpful launching the devnet and having people kind of look uh look into that um and then finally does it make sense to like already schedule another one of these calls or do people prefer to do this like async um yeah oh terence yeah i wonder sorry i came late so i wonder if this was discussed has there been any thoughts about having some sort of meta spec just because for me i'm uh, like looking at all the specs yeah. And it's hard to know which one is the version that we're aiming for. So something like that would be nice. I think Proto has one, but I'm not sure how 
Oh, it changed 30 minutes ago, so that must be. Yes, I'm adding easy. links as they pop up to keep track of everything. But I, we yeah. do not have a versioning scheme for the EIP. So all these different yeah. resources are at varying stages of progress. And we'll be discussing the executable spec for the execution layer on our core devs next week if uh, that's the type of stuff people are interested in. Uh, sorry, George? No, I was just going to say that like this uh, desync between the two specs right now is an actual like issue because um, with Xiaowei, we did the consensus specs uh, for eight four four thing to be executable, and that uh, brought a bunch of like edits and differences and right now the two specs are pretty desynchronized in terms of the KZG stuff and I've been waiting to make an EIPPR um, to bring it in sync but I'm not sure when to do that so that's that was another topic I wanted to raise in this call but maybe we can do it on the next one like what's the best way to keep the two sync uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Is the reason for not uh, updating the EAP regularly just because um, too much hassle and you wait until things are kind of hammered out and then update the EAP, or is there some other reason that the EAP is lagging? Yeah, that's that's the reason. That like it's like two like code duplication in the code base, but to like change the second code duplicate, I need to go through the whole PR process, and so right. I was waiting to batch a bunch of stuff inside before I do so. But this is all related to the execution executable spec thing. So maybe after the ACD, we can do uh, have a more like productive discussion about this stuff. I do think, yeah, I think this is like one of the best examples of like, like why how our process is broken. Because, anyways, like yeah, and, and I know we're already over time, but I, I think if if you want to come. Or and Proto as well, like uh, on Awkward Devs to like kind of highlight that next week. I think it would be good um, because I don't think this is the last time we have a feature that touches like both layers. And um, yeah, yep. Um, yeah, sweet. Yeah, that that would be that'd be really helpful. Yeah, I guess do people want to set up the next call right now, or do we want to do that async um, outside of this? And the time, I guess, looking just like roughly at the next couple of weeks, I think the time I would propose would be like Wednesday, August 17th at 14 UTC. So if everyone here is happy with that, we can just put that now. Otherwise, we can just chat about it uh, on, on the Discord. So any objections to the 17th, 1400 UTC? Okay, no objections. Uh, cool, so I will see you all then. Um, and yeah, let me share the notes in the chat here. I'll post them in the in the GitHub agenda as well. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone. This was, this was really good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Careful.